So, hey, I'd like to ask you a question today. Um, you ever watched a, a Little League baseball game that is, they have this thing called T-ball, okay? And these guys are like six years old, five years old, and the most important thing to them is waving at their mom and dad. It's not anything... And then they and then they got to go to bat, right? And then and, and they're over at bat, and 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 you know the t balls there, and 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 they're and, and and they're looking like this over their shoulder at their mom and dad, and they're looking at grandpa over there who's saying home run, baby, home run, and 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 it's just I, it, then the guy hits the ball and he forgets to run, right? I mean it's just and it, why because he wants to know if dad and mom and everybody saw him hit the ball, and it's hilarious. So, you know, I'd like you to, I'd like to keep a thought this morning, and it's really, it really kind of follows the resurrection, and it's this. Who's your audience? Who's in your grandstands? In the great, in the great, great moment of participation in life, who are you looking at for approval? Who, who, who are you waving to up there? You know, we're going we're gonna to flip through something. I, I want you to gain a, a little understanding here about grandstands, okay? Let's take a look at this next slide, okay? Now, this is, uh, this is University Park in Stockton, and there's only room for two there, okay? So, so who's in your grandstand? It's the one right next to you probably, okay? That person that you're seeing. Here's, here's the next picture. Okay, this is Delta College Stadium. They got a capacity of 200, okay? And, um, and, and, and the idea is this, who's in your grandstands? There's more opportunity, you guys. Does this make sense? There's, there's more opportunity for distraction. Let's move on to the next slide there. Okay, and this is AA Stag High School. <whistles> Go Delta Kings, okay? Any other Delta King people in here, okay? Praise God for the Christians, okay? Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I support Christians in other schools too. But there's a there's a brand new stadium. It wasn't there when I was in high school. Okay, it seats about fifteen hundred people, and there's a little bit more room for distraction, if you know what I mean. Okay, let's move on to the next one. All right. Okay, now we got the University of Pacific, the Spano Center, okay, built in 1981 and 82, okay. I was going to UOP, and I'm watching the thing be built, and I'm going, I wonder how many people this holds. It was just, it was just a big structure. I'm going, there's 6,000 fans in there. I've been in there for a volleyball tournament, okay, and, and there was 6,100 people inside of there. And you realize the number of people that there are that you could be paying attention to? Because the question is, who's in your grandstands? Let's move on to the next slide, okay? Now, now we're getting to the Chase Center in San Francisco, okay? And, and, and the Chase Center holds 18,000 people, home of the Warriors, right? And, and how many more people is there to be distracted by? There's so many more things to be paying attention to. What about the next slide? Okay. Then we got Oracle Park, San Francisco. I thought I'd... Thought I'd support you Giant fans, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put up Yankee Stadium, okay? I just want you guys to know that, okay? But there's 45,000 people, and you could lose even more distraction. Where's that one? And then we got Oakland A Stadium, okay? Uh, Oakland Coliseum, that holds 55,945. But they've covered up part of it up top, and now it only holds 43,000. But they'll open it up if they need to. And the truth is you can get even more, but, but, but the biggest stadium in all of the United United States is called the Big House. And the Big House is in Ant Arbor, Michigan, and holds over 107,000 people. How easy would it be to be distracted by all of these opportunities when in reality we've been asked, we've been asked to have an audience of one? Now that audience is not me, okay? It's, it's not Keith Evans, it's not Tom Bett George, it, it, it's Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at one more slide here, okay? Is Jesus in your grandstand? Is that the one we're looking to? I am so glad that people have reminded me and reminded me and reminded me over the years that, that Jesus Christ needs to be the one in the grandstand. And that when we're looking back, that's, that's who we're seeing. You know, sometimes in life we hit a home run and we feel like, oh, man, everybody loves us. And we're getting all these praise for everybody. And then when we fumble the ball, we feel terrible. And it's like, so who's in your grandstands during each of those times? On the field of life, 
Who do you want to please? That's really the key issue here. And, and when we come off of Resurrection Sunday, I want you to know this. Man, for what he did for us, our joy and admiration should be in, man, exalt the Father, enjoy the Father, and let's find praise and glory and honoring the one who overcame death. Let's take a look at 1 Samuel 14. Incredible little story. Maybe, you're, maybe, maybe this will be the first time that you hear this story. But it's, a, it's an incredible story about, about, about a man named Jonathan. Okay? And it goes like this. One day Jonathan, son of Saul, came to the young man bearing his armor. Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Now his father was the king. His father was the one who should be leading this. Why did he not tell him? Because he knew his father was lazy. He knew his father was already afraid of, afraid of the people because he'd lost his audience. His audience was his own self and his own pride. His audience was not the Lord. Where's Saul here? Let's pick it up in verse 2. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him about 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phianus, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. 600 guys... And that's really important to capture this 600 number as we come down a little bit farther. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. Get the idea? This is not a, this is not a simple journey. One was called Bozes, the other Shenna. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash, the other to the south towards Gibba. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come. Let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead and I am with you, heart and soul. Man, isn't it great to have a friend like that? I'm with you, heart and soul. I'm, I'm I, I, I believe in you and I believe in the God that you're trusting. My eyes are on him because your eyes are on him. And we are going to accomplish great things if God wants these things to take place. Verse 8. Jonathan said, come then, we will cross over toward the men and, see them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait here until we come to you, we will stay here. And we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us. We will climb up because they will be on our, that will be a sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. They knew. They knew they were a petrified group of people. They knew they were scared. They knew their eyes had come off the Lord. They knew that their leader, Saul, had backed off. And basically was interested in his own self in the grandstands and not God Almighty. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his outbears and, and his armor bearers, Come up to us and he'll teach you a lesson. And we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to the armor bearer, Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into our hands. The hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in the area of about a half an acre. You know, the power of one before God is incredible. The power of one when God is on our side is incredible. And the truth is, some days are simply way more memorable than others. I coached volleyball, and there was a girl on her team that all she ever did was look at her mom. And I told her one day, I said, if you look at your mom again and you don't look at me, I says, I'm going to bench you. She's the best girl on the team. 
I said, because I have some things that I want to say to you. I says, is, is what I'm thinking as the coach more important than what your mom is thinking at this point in time? And she says, well, I just want to know what she thinks. I said, do you want to know what I think? <laughs> I, I, I didn't know how to answer the question. But, but here's Jonathan. He's following the prompting of the Lord. You know, he went. Even though he was not the military leader, even though he was not king, even though Saul was afraid, he went. He knew that Saul was hiding with these 600 people. And Jonathan asked his armor bearer to go. And I love verse 6 where it says, Come, let us go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. It was an invitation to battle. It was an invitation against the wickedness of the world. And his armor, armor bearer's voice was, Yes, simply... I, I want the audience of one also. Remember, Saul was king and he was the leader. Jonathan was not trying to outdo his father. He was trying to, he was so in tune with what God wanted that he wanted God to be pleased. And if somebody else wasn't going to do it, he was. Notice in verse 9, his eyes are on the Lord. Notice this in verse 9. If they say to us such and such, then we'll do this. But if they, but if, but if such and such happens, we'll do this. We're going to listen to the ear and the heart of God. We're going to pay attention and ask the Lord for a sign. Look at their confidence in verse 10 when he says this. He says, that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. You see, this wasn't Jonathan's battle. It was God's battle. There's a lot of people in life who take on a battle themselves when in all genuineness, it's really God's battle. You know, there's a thing called a fleece. And a fleece is something that's God, I'm asking for a miracle. And, and Gideon had an incredible fleece in the Old Testament. And some of you are aware of it, okay? And, and basically, uh, he's, he says, God, I need a sign that, that, that what you want me to do. And two nights in a row, he asked for a different sign that was exactly the opposite, two nights in a row. One of the nights, he said, dear God, when the, when, when, when the sheepskin is wet, I want the whole ground dry, and I'll know that's a sign from you. Now, that's, that's a miracle right there, okay? Well, the other night, he said, hey, make the fleece dry, but the whole ground wet. That's a miracle, too. God, I want what you want. You are my audience. I'm not going to pay attention to anything else except the hand of God that takes place. He was asking God because his eyes were on the Lord. He knew his father's eyes weren't. You know, there's so many Bible reminders about, about, about trusting God first. You know, there's a story of Elijah on Mount Carmel where he's, he's going up against 850 evil prophets. 450 of them were Baals of were prophets of Baal, and there was 400 other prophets uh, after after wicked things. And, but but yet he's one, and he says, "Dear God, I dear God, I trust in you." You know, there's a story of Samuel. Okay, the story of one where where he's hey, it's 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 not it's not Abinadab, the older brother. It's not Eliam, the next. It's hey, it's it's David. It's the power of one where where Samuel says, "God, which one is it?" And my eyes are on you, and, and you have said to me, it, don't consider his height, and don't consider his appearance, consider his heart. And there's a story of Noah, the story of one who built an ark, and he stayed out for, and you guys have a project in your backyard that takes a long time? How about 100 years? <laughs> Man, if I had to pull weeds for 100 years, I'd just let them grow. I'm serious. Okay, how many guys can relate to that? Okay. Thank you for being, Bev, I just want you to know that people voted for all that, okay? Um, in Exodus, there's a story of one, and his name is Moses. In the Gospels, there's, story of, there's stories of, of somebody like Peter walking on water. One of the greatest challenges in life is, is not to look at all the circumstances, but, but to keep our eyes on the glorious Lord. I love Psalms 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. You know, then there's, then, then there's this idea of follow through. Follow through is one of man's greatest weaknesses. Okay? And, 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 and the follow through comes from verses, verse 11 area, okay? And in verse 11, that's where he says, 
That's where he says in verse 11. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. Is this the time to get scared and take our eyes off of, G off of the Lord? Is this the time to be excited because the Lord has given us that anticipation of what to do? And look at this. The men of the outpost shouted at J to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. <laughs> and at that point in time, he's thinking, the hand of Almighty God has spoken. Let's go after him. Because a lot of people, that's the moment in time they would say, oh. See ya. They followed through. God's faithfulness in the battle took place. And 20 Philistine men fell to Jonathan the armor bearer. But you know, there's this incredible verse, and I stopped before it on purpose. Listen to this. This is what happens after these 20, 20 people die. Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and the field and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. That audience of one sent a panic through everything, and it's like, God can do amazing things through one person because of having our eyes on the Lord. Would you, would, would you keep in mind verse 6? Verse 6 is probably the key verse here. It says, nothing hinders the Lord. <laughs> In the second service, we're going to be having a young man who's getting baptized, and uh, his name's Omar. Omar's got quite a story. I'm not going to steal what he's going to say, but I'm going to say this. When you're a guy like Omar, <laughs> hey, fearing the Lord is easy because he's, he's overcome so many b battles with men. We need to keep in that thought that God is almighty. God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is ever, and, and, and we forget that sometimes. We're like, God, are you here? You know, I want you to know that God uses all kinds of people. He uses you and he uses me. I found this incredible picture. I've seen this before. I think I've actually read it here before. It says this. It says, do you seriously think God can't use you? Noah was a drunk. Isaac was a daydreamer. Leah was ugly. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Noah ran from God. Naomi was a widow, Job went bankrupt, Peter denied Jesus, the disciples fell asleep praying, Martha worried about everything, the Samaritan woman was divorced, Zacchaeus was too small, Paul was too religious, Timothy had an ulcer, and Lazarus was dead. <laughs> I heard this this week, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. When you die, you don't have to do God's work here on earth anymore. Nowhere in Scripture does it speak of retirement from a walk with God. I'd like to show you a little video about a guy who thought, he genuinely thought that life was over. It's called Nick, it's the story of a man named Nick. Nick Vujicic is an internet sensation whose antics have gone viral as he refuses to let severe disability stand in his way. They call it phocomelia, which means a baby being born without limbs with no medical reason. It was quite a tragedy and a shock to my parents. My doctors told them that I would not walk, that I would not go to school. Um, and my mum and dad, being very strong believers in Jesus, uh, saw me as obviously their little boy, but still a gift of God, just differently packaged. It was about the age of five or six that I first knew that I was different. And I started entering into a depression at age eight. I felt very sad. I felt very alone. I prayed to God. I prayed that he would give me arms and legs. And he didn't respond. 
and in his lack of response um, in the way that I thought he should have responded, I started believing he didn't love me. I started believing that he didn't exist. And maybe I was just born into misery. Nick got so depressed that he considered committing suicide at the age of 10. I tried to drown myself in a bathtub, and there was only one thing that was the pain that I would leave in my parents' hearts and minds with them burying their limbless boy. But then my confidence started growing. My maturity started expanding in understanding I have a choice, either to be angry for what I do not have or be thankful for what I do have. But what really struck me the most was when I was 15 years old, when my life changed forever. I read John chapter 9, a man was born blind, and no one knew why he was born that way. And I'm like, oh, I can relate to that. <laughs> and Jesus said it was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him. And I thought, wow, if Jesus had a plan for a blind man, then he has a plan for me. Thanks to Nick's faith and positive attitude, it seems like nothing can hold him back. At age 19, I found myself in front of 316-year-olds and I was speaking. Within a couple of minutes, half the girls were crying. Then one girl in the middle of the room started weeping. She put up her hand and she said, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but can I come up there and give you a hug? She came up and she hugged me and she cried on my shoulder and she said, thank you, thank you, thank you. No one's ever told me that they love me and no one's ever told me that I'm beautiful the way that I am. And that's when I knew I was born to be a speaker. So he came to me, he unwrapped me, he looked at me, wrapped me back up, went back to my mum and said, he's beautiful. Nick has now taken his message of hope to a staggering 57 countries and an audience of hundreds of millions, including 13 presidents. And now he has company on his travels. In 2012, he married Kanye, and they're expecting their second child this summer. And we want to just share our story with everyone, my wife and I, because we've come across a lot of people who are not happy, who have given up on themselves and given up on love. And we want them to not give up. I look at the world that we live in and all the pain, and I say, without heaven, what do we have? It's not a coping mechanism, but everything starts making more sense when our eyes are fixed on eternity. I don't need arms and legs for 90 years because arms and legs are probably going to give me arthritis later on anyway. But when you don't get a miracle, you can still be a miracle for someone else. I think we should add one to the list. And Nick was limbless. You know, I'd like you to uh, take away four simple thoughts today. Um, and these four key things are, are why we have a ministry fair the week after Easter. It's why we have a ministry fair on a day of a, of a baptism in the second service. I want you to know this. This is why our eyes should be on Jesus. Number one is this. God's rewards are eternal. Every other eternal faith. Anybody got an old trophy at home that's missing one of the arms? I mean, I mean man, when you were oh, holding that thing with both hands, it was crazy. But, but God's rewards... Rewards are eternal. The second is this. God doesn't grade on a curve. Okay? He, he, he only expects me to be me. I don't have to be any of you, and you don't have to be me. God has gifted you, and you should realize this. God doesn't grade on a curve. He just looks at you and says, are you using what you've been given? The third one is this. If you're trying to be somebody else, the world's going to miss you. <laughs> Quite frankly, the world's going to miss you. And, 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 you don't, and when we put those together with the others, that's great. And, and, and the last one is this, is that all of this goes back to the great promise that took place in Genesis chapter 12 where, where Abraham is told, I'm going to bless you and the entire world is going to be blessed through you. So everyone's going to be blessed. And I want to encourage you today to just simply say to yourself, dear God, I want you to be my audience more than anything in all the world. And I'd love to take a little step of faith in serving you and honoring you 
absolutely the best that I can. Why? Because he did what was inconvenient when he gave us the Last Supper, when he gave us the cross.